Okay. All right. Hopefully this all works. Sorry for the uh, delay in getting the AV set up. So everyone on Zoom, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we yes, can. They will. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm Don Williams. I'm a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Alabama. And as Dave mentioned, I'm uh, on sabbatical this semester. I'm dividing my time between the University of Kansas and the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. I have driven past a lot of cornfields recently. And uh, so just briefly, also, I was, if someone's monitoring the chat, let me know if there are any questions. That'd be great because I am not monitoring that. Uh, this is, yeah, sorry, we're just going to do this manually. Um, so, uh, so I just briefly want to acknowledge the uh, Ice Cube collaboration of which I'm a member and also uh, Dave Besson, and uh, this consists of over uh, 40 institutions in the US, Europe, and uh, the Asia Pacific region. And uh, in particular, to acknowledge the NSF uh, EPSCOR uh, grant, uh, which uh, Dave and I and some other people are co PIs on, and that's what's actually funding my trip here. Okay. Um, so, uh, briefly, I'm going to introduce uh, the star of my talk, which is uh, the neutrino. Uh, it is a uh, standard model particle, a fundamental particle. And um, the standard model particles consist of the quarks, uh, some of which make up uh, familiar particles like protons and neutrons, and also the leptons, which are these uh, lighter particles, and the um, yeah, And each of these leptons, uh, the most familiar of which is the electron, but it also has two heavier cousins, the muon and the tau. Each of them has an associated neutrino with it. And the leptons interact via the weak force, uh, the charged ones also via the electric force. Um, the neutrino is the lowest mass particle by far in the standard model. We're not sure what its absolute mass is, uh, but current studies put it at less than one electron volt rest mass that is way below, uh, for example, uh, the electron, which is 511 kilovolts. And uh, the neutrino, because it is a neutral particle, that's where its name comes from, uh, it only interacts via the weak force and you know, technically because of its mass, the gravitational force, but that's certainly not important for the uh, uh, purpose of this talk. And um, as I mentioned, neutrinos, they come in these three flavors, so there's one for each of the three uh, leptons. So this is the particle physics side of the uh, neutrino, but, and we could talk about that you know, for a whole semester. There's a lot of things that we're still discovering about the neutrino and a lot of things that it has taught us about the standard model and about the limitations of the standard model. Um, but actually I'm gonna be discussing the uh, uh, neutrino in the context of astronomy. So switching gears entirely, uh, in the history of astronomy, we have always learned new things about the universe when we open up new windows in the electromagnetic spectrum. So originally astronomy was you know, optical with eyeballs and then we started you know, with telescopes and we have extended telescopes in through the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this, these are actually pictures of the galactic plane, that's the horizontal streak you see here uh, in these various uh, electromagnetic windows, radiating microwave, infrared optical, X-ray, and gamma rays. Now, uh, electromagnetic waves do have a shortcoming in astronomy once you start getting into the high energy universe. Um, so this plot is one of these log log plots that cover many orders of magnitude that are beloved in our field. So distance is on the y axis here, energy is on the x axis, and the uh, kind of horizontal lines here indicate what these distances mean. And as we get to higher energies, kind of above, uh, you know, 10 to the 12, you know, above, uh, you know, 100 you know, TeV, 10 to the TeV, up to hundreds of TeV, the universe actually starts to become opaque to electromagnetic waves. Um, so, you know, this, uh, for example, around here is about 10 to the 15 electron volts. Uh, photons here are interacting with the cosmic microwave background. That's what this middle bump is. This bump is the uh, infrared background on the uh, left, and the one on the right is the cosmic uh, uh, radio background. And so if you want to look at the universe at these energies, you need a different messenger. And so that has brought in the concept of multi-messenger astronomy, which has been a very hot topic in astronomy in the last few years. And uh, these are bringing in non-electromagnetic messengers. Um, so particles uh, include neutrinos and cosmic rays. And then of course, new kid on the block is gravitational waves, which made a very spectacular debut a few years ago. That's represented by the ripples in the background of the plot here. 
Um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, neutrinos. And what's interesting about neutrinos, they do not interact with these backgrounds, and so they can travel through the universe. And unlike cosmic rays, which are charged particles, neutrinos are neutral, and therefore they point back to their sources. Uh, charged particles tend to get bent in magnetic fields, which are ubiquitous in the universe, so cosmic rays do not point back easily to their sources. And the um, uh, next couple of slides I'm going to discuss is actually uh, a fundamental connection between gamma rays, the highest energy electromagnetic uh, you know, waves and highest energy photons, and neutrinos and cosmic rays. So I should briefly mention a little bit more. Cosmic rays, these charged particles, um, they are mostly charged nuclei at these high energies, either protons or, or uh, heavier nuclei in some cases. And we see them up to energies of 10 to the 20 electron volts, as right here. And so um, the question of what accelerates these cosmic rays also drives this connection between these three messengers and this you know, search for what's going on in the high energy universe. Okay, um, so the idea is that these high energy cosmic rays, these high energy charged nuclei, protons, heavier nuclei, et cetera, are accelerated in some kind of cosmic environment. We call these cosmic accelerators. What these environments might be, I'll discuss a little bit more in the next few slides. Generally speaking, they should be environments with either strong magnetic fields or relativistic shocks or both, uh, environments which can accelerate particles to these very high energies. And when you have protons being accelerated, they're going to interact with their environment. So they can either interact with uh, other protons, other you know, cosmic rays, or with photons, or both. And in either of those cases, you're going to get other particles. Um, so if a uh, proton interacts with a, another proton, or with a gamma ray, you're going to get some pion production. You're going to get some other processes as well, but I'm going to focus on pion production. And pions, if they're charged, they will uh, decay, and the decay products include neutrinos. And then if uh, you have neutral pions, then the decay will always be to gamma rays. Um, so neutrinos and gamma rays should be being produced in the same environments where protons, that is cosmic rays, are being accelerated. Uh, the bottom row here, these are leptonic processes. These are where electrons are being accelerated. We know this is always happening. Electrons are easy to accelerate. Uh, but uh, protons must also be being accelerated because we see these accelerated particles here on Earth. So the takeaway message is whatever environments are accelerating protons, cosmic rays, should also be producing neutrinos and gamma rays as well. So the uh, possible source I'm going to focus on a little bit here is a uh, active galactic nucleus. So for non-astronomers in the audience, this is a galaxy with a supermassive black hole in its center. Most galaxies have them. We have one. You know, about 4, 4 million solar masses is the mass of our black hole. Uh, but these really active galaxies, uh, their uh, supermassive black holes can be much bigger, perhaps billions of solar masses. And what makes them active is that they are uh, accreting material at a tremendous rate. And so this material is uh, usually accreting in the shape of a disk, spiraling into the black hole. And along the way, you also get these jets being produced, which are perpendicular to the accretion disk uh, uh, plane. And in these jets, you have strong magnetic fields. That's what's confining the particles, sort of collimating these disks. And you should also have relativistic shock. So these are very nice sites for potential particle acceleration. And what I show here is a few uh, photographs of real galaxies, uh, which have these jets. Um, what I'm showing here, the jets themselves are shown in false color. This is radio. Um, and the radio is actually synchrotrons from electrons, which are relativistic electrons, which are spiraling in the magnetic fields of these jets. And so this is Cygnus A, this is M87, this is Antares A, so you see all these you know, jets. The galaxy itself is kind of relatively small in the middle, it's got these you know, huge jets coming out of it. And just to kind of underline the connection to the supermassive black hole in the center, this galaxy right here, M87, actually had its black hole imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope in 2015, sorry, 2019. Um, so this is the image of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, supermassive black uh, hole image from this galaxy under here, which was M87. Now, the uh, galaxies that I showed you previously, I show you the jets from the side, but galaxies are all you know, randomly oriented with respect to our line of sight which means that sometimes the jet axis will be aligned with our line of sight. We'll be looking down the barrel of the uh, jet, as it were. And so this is you know, a picture of the uh, active galaxy, the black hole in the center from the side. You see the jets. 
And then the uh, picture here is uh, showing the, uh, uh, you know, we're looking down the, uh, the jet, <laughs> then we're actually looking down the acceleration, uh, you know, the, the, you know, right down at the side of acceleration. Again, these particles are being combined by magnetic fields in this jet and interacting with relativistic shocks, and that's where they're getting their energy. Now, the uh, plot in the middle, where I'm trying to follow this with the pointer as well. Uh, the plot in the middle uh, is a spectral energy distribution of a blazar, Mercurian 421. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I said a blazar is what we call it when the AGM jet is aligned with our line of sight. We're looking you know, down the barrel of the jet. Um, so this is a spectral energy energy distribution of Mercurian 421. And uh, again, it's a log log plot flux here versus frequency going all the way from radio to gamma rays. And on the radio side, kind of the low energy side. What we see is synchrotron from electrons that are spiraling in this magnetic field. So, you know, that's to be expected. On the high energy side, that's the question that could be from uh, either just elect again, electrons accelerating and photons uh, picking up energy from interactions with those electrons, which is inverse Compton scattering, or it could be uh, gamma rays from, for example, the decay of neutral pi. Um, so it's not always easy to tell on a case by case basis which one it is, um, but this is a possible link between acceleration of uh, protons and gamma rays. And if gamma rays and protons are being accelerated, or sorry, uh, gamma rays are being produced by accelerated protons, then we expect neutrinos as well from the charge points. Uh, this right here in the uh, corner is the um, uh, map of uh, very high energy gamma ray sources in our sky. Uh, this is the galactic plane is the horizontal line. And all of the red marks here are blazars. So most of the high energy gamma ray sources we see outside of our galaxy are blazars. So the uh, what do the different colors mean in the center of page seven? I'm getting to that. So the different colors are flares. So sometimes blazars will enter what's called the flaring state. We're not entirely sure what causes that. We think it's associated with a temporary increase in the rate of accretion into the black hole. And in that case, um, you will see a overall rise in the amount of flux being produced by the blazar um, across the board. And so the different colors just represent flux measurements at different times. And you see just overall, there's this uh, increase in the, uh, in the flux. So hopefully that uh, answered your question from the chat. Okay, so there are other possible acceleration sources as well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over them all, um, but uh, any place where you have strong magnetic fields and or relativistic environments, uh, where you have shock waves, those are potential particle acceleration sites. So supernova remnants are a possibility. Think of the Crab Nebula, right? There's quite strong magnetic fields in that region and uh, you know, a lot of relativistic particles. Uh, starburst galaxies, which are galaxies that are producing new stars at an extremely high rate, and therefore they have high rates of uh, supernovas as well. And also gamma ray bursts, uh, which can arise from a couple of different sources, depending on the length of the burst. Now, the kind of bottom line is that all of these potential sources, all the sources which have the magnetic fields and relativistic shocks necessary to accelerate cosmic rays, they are all very distant, which means that if they're producing neutrinos, which we expect that they should be, the fluxes will be very low. And that is what motivated the construction of Ice Cube. We needed something large enough to measure a very low flux. So people did some calculations, you know, back a few decades ago. And uh, the figure of merit was that we should be able to see uh, neutrinos from cosmic accelerators based on what we knew about the cosmic ray uh, energy spectrum and the distribution of potential sources. Uh, it was expected that if we had an instrumented volume of about a cubic kilometer, we should be able to see, you know, 10 to 100 of these events per year, uh, which is enough to, you know, start doing science. And so um, there were a number of different uh, detectors which were uh, proposed and uh, went in various stages. And we do have some uh, cousin experiments, uh, which are in water. Uh, but IceCube was the first to achieve this target instrumented volume. And uh, IceCube, as the name implies, is deployed in ice. Specifically, the ice at the Amundsen Scott uh, South Pole Station, uh, which is near the geographic South Pole in Antarctica. Uh, the ice cap there is about three kilometers thick, give or take. And uh, so we drilled down about two and a half kilometers um, and uh, instrumented the bottom half of each, uh, uh, in each borehole, we put a cable called a string. And the bottom half of each string is instrumented with 60 digital optical modules, which is called DOMs. These are sensors, they sense the light from particle interactions in the ice. And this was considered a large enough 
volumes that it should be able to discover nutrients from cosmic accelerants. Um, we do have a denser subarray in our center called Deep Core um, that we do low energy neutrino physics with. Um, I won't be discussing that in this talk for in the interest of time, but we have quite a lot of interesting activity there. We also have 81 uh, cosmic ray detectors on the surface. Uh, we call that ice top, and we do cosmic ray air shower physics there. Uh, we completed construction in 2010, and we've been running continuously ever since uh, as a full detector uh, since we uh, did commissioning in 2011. Uh, we run all the time. We've routinely achieved uptimes of over 99%. That's 365 days a year, every single year, uh, in recent years especially. And uh, there's a reason why you know, this constant uptime is so important, which I'll uh, get to. This is just a quick look at the inside of our sensor, the DOM. Uh, so on the upper right is a uh, still picture, and then there's an animation showing you know, kind of a cutaway of it. Uh, the sensor is a blast pressure vessel containing a single 10 inch photomultiplier tube. Again, that is a light sensor, it senses light from particle interactions. And there's a digitizing electronic core, that's where the D in the name comes from, it sends a digitized signal up the uh, cable to the surface. And we also have flasher LEDs, that's actually one of the things I'm in charge of, and we use that as a calibration source, uh, in particular to calibrate the properties of the ice. We have over 5,000 of these in the ice. Uh, over 98% of them are still operating after all this time, so it's a very, you know, stable uh, long wave detector. Stop on here. <clears throat> okay, so what does the uh, neutrino signature look like in ice cube? You never see neutrinos themselves, right? You see them after they interact. Now, at the energies we're talking about, remember, we're talking about exploring the part of the universe that is, you know, more opaque to photons, so we're talking around, you know, tens of TeV, hundreds of TeV, PeV energies, 10 to the 15 electron volt energies, think of that. At those energies, absolutely the dominant neutrino interaction in ice is called deep and elastic scattering. And that is when the neutrino interacts violently with a nucleon in the ice, basically shatters it. And what happens depends on the type of interaction. Um, so the top row here uh, demonstrates what's called the charge current interaction, in which case the neutrino comes in and what comes out is the lepton that belongs to that neutrino. Electron neutrino produces an electron, tau neutrino produces a tau, muon neutrino produces a muon. Um, and now there's also something called a neutral current event, which is where a neutrino comes in and a neutrino goes out. Well, I'll start with the charge current events. Um, so these are simulated uh, plots at the uh, bottom here. And in these plots, uh, the colors indicate timing. Um, so red is early and green is late. So you can use that kind of trace the uh, particle to the detector. And the uh, size of you know, each uh, dot or each circle represents a, uh, a module being hit, uh, sensing light. And uh, the larger it is, the more light that sensor is seeing. That's a charge because the light is you know, translated into uh, a current being a photoelectric. Um, so the, uh, if the, now if the muon is produced, uh, the muon, these are you know, going to be extremely relativistic particles. So the muon will range easily out of the detector and we call that a track. So what you're seeing is just light being uh, you know, uh, uh, given off by the muon as it travels through the detector. If you get an electron, which is in the middle, the electron will um, immediately interact with other particles in the ice. So you'll see all the other electrons in the ice that will interact with them. It'll make what's called a shower or a cascade which is about 10 meters in length. That's quite small compared to the spacing between DOMs and ice cubes. So it doesn't look quite quite light, but it looks you know, almost quasi spherical with light just spreading out from that interaction uh, you know, shower light. Uh, kind of an interesting possibility is the tau. Um, so the tau lepton has a much shorter lifetime than the muon. So even if it is very relativistic, it's still gonna decay relatively quickly. And so we have the possibility of seeing the initial interaction, which is the production of the tau, and the decay of the tau. We call this a double bang or double cascade. Um, now, if you have a neutral current, which is neutrino in, neutrino out, you still see the light from the shattering of the nucleus. That creates what's called a hadronic cascade. Basically, all the you know, quarks get all scrambled. We get mesons and other particles from that. And so, in that case, a neutral current will produce a cascade like signature regardless of phase. And so for the uh, double bang, I should mention, uh, we're only going to see that resolved above about 100 TeV in energy. Below that, the tau decay length will, on average, be much too short for us to see, and we'll just see a single cascade. So this double bang signature is only a characteristic of very high energy down the trees. So this is a simulation showing an animation of a uh, track event moving through the ice. So this is you know, a uh, muon produced by a charged current uh, uh, event. 
And um, these kind of lines that you see here, those represent photons actually coming out from the uh, track, and they're not traveling in straight lines because the ice is a scattering medium. And this is a whole other uh, topic, uh, but there are there is dust in the ice which uh, causes the light to scatter so it doesn't travel in a straight line. We have to take that into account when we're reconstructing our events. But because of the long lever arm of a typical track, which is going through the detector, and it could either start in the detector or more commonly start outside the detector if it happens to be pointing through and actually go all the way through the detector, as it's shown here. And this is the best direction resolution we can really get. It's you know a tenth to a half a degree at these uh, energies, which is horrible for an astronomer, but it's about the best we can do. By comparison, the full moon is about half a degree. So you know, but this, this, this is the best we can do with particles. This is just showing the PSF on a, uh, on a sky map. Because the muon is not completely contained, our energy resolution is only kind of you know, good to a factor of two um, because a lot of energy is being deposited outside of the detector. Now, for the cascade, um, in that case, uh, you can easily have the event contained entirely within the detector. Um, so your energy resolution is much better, it's about 10%, uh, but the direction is much worse because the cascade is very short compared to the distance between doms. Um, so your angular resolution is like 10 to 15 degrees. So it's still better than gravitational waves, but it's not very good for astronomy. And this is what the PSF again looks like on a sky map. So our cascades, um, and we'll kind of you know, look at this a bit, you know, they're really most useful when we're talking about energy. And uh, you know, we'll, you know, what the energy of these events are, whereas the tracks are the most useful for direction. Now we have uh, obviously a lot of events which are backgrounds to our search for cosmic neutrinos. Um, so uh, these cosmic rays that I mentioned interact with our atmosphere all the time and create showers of particles, which include both muons and neutrinos. The muons from above the detector, that is from for us the southern hemisphere sky can easily penetrate all the way down into the ice and uh, into the detectors. We actually see like 3,000 of those a second at trigger level. Um, now, we do not see muons from the northern hemisphere sky. The Earth blocks them out, but there are neutrinos produced in these showers as well. And we see them from all directions, and we see them at a, the rate of about a few hundred per day. We call these atmospheric neutrinos, and they are background to our astrophysical or cosmic search. Uh, but we can do a lot of interesting science with them, specifically in fundamental neutrino physics, oscillations, and do a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, so in order to try and separate a uh, cosmic signal uh, from this atmospheric background, uh, there's a few rejection strategies we can use. One is going to higher energies. Um, since the uh, cosmic uh, neutrinos, we expect to have a harder spectrum uh, than the atmospheric spectrum, so have more high energy events. Uh, looking for contained events, since the muons from the air showers come from outside the detectors, we look for events that start inside the detector. And then, as I mentioned, we also look for upgoing events, which for us is events from the northern hemisphere sky, in order to use the Earth to screen out muons. So those are the background rejection strategies that we use. Now, there is a lot of science that you can do with IceCube because it is a very multi-purpose detector. Um, you know, we detect neutrinos and muons, and principle we could detect other types of particles as well if they were there. Um, you know, we're in this glacier. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting data there. And, you know, we have these tremendous amounts of atmospheric neutrinos for science, as well as all of our cosmic rays and our cosmic ray air shower detector. So this is a, you know, kind of view of all the different science topics that we pursue in IceCube. And, you know, obviously I could spend the whole semester if I were to cover all of this. So for this talk, I'm just going to focus on our core mission, which is, you know, doing astronomy with neutrinos, how that folds into the uh, expanding landscape of multi-messenger astronomy, and then uh, our latest results and how that uh, gives us insight into the environments of these cosmic accelerators. Um, so these are just showing you uh, examples of actual events. So these are not simulations. These are actual uh, events that we've seen represented in the same way. Um, so this is a uh, starting track. Um, so the, you know, these are you know, muons. Uh, they're you know, charged, you know, they're muons produced by charged current muon neutrino super elastic scattering events. Uh, this one is a starting event. Um, so you know, it starts in from the, uh, from the right here. The neutrino comes in silently and then interacts and then out comes the muon. And then the uh, one on the right is a through going muon. So this is a muon that, uh, you know, inter so a muon neutrino that interacted with the ice outside the detector, produced the muon, which then went through the detector. This one is up going, which means it is definitely a neutrino, or rather a muon that came from a neutrino and not from the atmosphere because it couldn't have gotten through the book. 
And this is an example, again, real data of a cascade. This is actually our highest energy contained cascade that we've ever seen. It's 2 PeV. And um, so, yeah, you kind of see, again, the light starting in the center and then moving outwards uh, more or less in all directions. And, you know, this, you can't tell on an event by event basis what this came from, but it would have come from either a charge current electron or tau event or a neutral current uh, event of any flavor. And so these are the handles that we use uh, to, you know, to, to sort of uh, identify flavors as well as uh, getting handles on direction and energy. Now, a fairly uh, recent uh, uh, discovery for us was uh, starting to uh, individually identify tau neutrino candidates. And so uh, this is one of our, you know, fairly recent papers we posted on archive, working on getting that published. Um, but we have uh, two tau neutrino candidates in our data sample now. And this is the best looking one that I show you. Um, the event display, that kind of looks like any cascade, but if you actually do a more detailed likelihood reconstruction, it is consistent with a double cascade. It just you know, doesn't have this, you know, look by eye. But if you look at the waveforms on the individual DOMs, so these are the time versus the charge versus time signal on the individual DOMs or these individual plots here. So you can see each one's a different sensor. Um, we see this double bump structure. And that is something that we expect uh, from Tau Neutrino. In fact, I had a student who did her uh, PhD work on this uh, on this signature. Unfortunately, she graduated one year before this event kept the detector. So again, that was kind of sad. Um, with the uh, Tau Neutrinos, we're starting to uh, you know, lock down a little bit more of our knowledge about the flavor ratios that we see in Ice Cube. Naively, we kind of expect equal amounts of all flavors because neutrinos uh, change uh, flavors between them. Um, so what we expect is this uh, red dot here. Uh, what we uh, our best fit is this black star here. But as you can see, we still have quite large error contours, and each of these axes of the triangle is one of these three candidates. Uh, there's other models as well. I won't get into that right now. We you know don't really uh, eliminate anything. Um, <clears throat> uh, certainly not, not at the 95% uh, level. Uh, but this motivates us to want to collect more statistics uh, on this uh, you know on, on this kind of. So putting all of that together, so all these tracks and cascades that I've shown you, as well as the uh, town neutrino events, which are part of our uh, broader cascade sample, um, we have a, uh, you know, kind of the first thing that we found with Ice Cube was that we did have a flux of neutrinos, which was consistent with being of astrophysical origin. It was not consistent with being from our atmosphere. The energy was too high and the flux was too high. Um, so uh, the black points here are from the contained cascade and track search, and uh, the blue shaded region is from the uh, through-going search. Uh, this plot is a little bit out of date from 2015, but the, you know, these, these plots, there's not, there's not a lot of difference between them to be seen by eye. Uh, the bottom line is that we saw you know, this high-energy neutrino flux. It was not consistent with the atmosphere. Um, to first order, it looked like it was coming from all over the sky. There was not like one source of these neutrinos. They were coming from all over the sky. So the next thing we had to do was figure out where the neutrinos are coming from. Now, one note here, um, this is uh, the pink triangles on the left are the diffuse uh, flux seen by Fermi. Again, this is flux as a function of energy, big log log plot, tons of energy, uh, tons of uh, order of magnitude. And the flux that we see is kind of of a similar energy uh, level of the uh, diffuse uh, gamma flux. Um, so that's interesting. Again, possibly hinting at a connection. Uh, over on the uh, right, these are the uh, cosmic rays um, going all the way out to about the next one. So the next question was, where are the neutrinos coming from? So the first thing we could do, and this is just, this is kind of like the you know, best uh, correlation that we've seen so far. We've done a number of different searches. I'll just focus on this one. Uh, we took all of the neutrinos, uh, the track events that we had that were high quality uh, in a 10-year uh, sample and put them on a sky map and looked for clustering. We had done this exercise a number of times before, but it was only when we had 10 years of data that we started to see a correlation with a known astrophysical object. And so this is the, uh, um, you know, basically we're looking for clusters in this neutrino map, because if we see a cluster that might be associated with a source, uh, atmospheric neutrinos are not expected to cluster, right? They're expected to be evenly spread out over the sky. Now, of course you can have chance associations. You have to take that into account. But when we did this search, we found that our strongest correlation was with this object here in the upper right, that is the galaxy M77, it's also NGC 1068. This is because it's a Messier uh, galaxy, it means we've known about it for hundreds of years. 
Uh, and this is an active galaxy. It's not a blazar, but it is an active galaxy, and it is also a starburst galaxy, and it has a high rate of star formation. So this is an interesting potential site of cosmic acceleration. Um, we found that the brightest spot we found in the southern hemisphere sky was not uh, statistically significant. Um, so the excess uh, is inconsistent with background at the level of 2.9 sigma. We are continuing the study of this source, so stay tuned for news there. Uh, this plot in the uh, lower right is just showing our sensitivity as a function of declination. Um, so bottom line is the left hand side is the uh, southern hemisphere sky where we're less sensitive because of the nuance coming from above. And the right is the northern hemisphere sky. These sensitivity curves are what we use to measure, um, you know, improvements that we would get from potential future iterations of the uh, detector. Now, there's only so much that we can do, and I, you know, as I said, that was just one search, just looking, you know, at all the neutrinos. We've done various searches uh, for, uh, you know, different catalog sources. We've stacked uh, different classes of sources and tried to find correlations there. A lot of different things that we've done. But we found out you know, pretty early on, there's only so much we could do by ourselves with our neutrino data. And that is where we started to really interface with the broader astronomical community and really participate in multi messenger astronomy. So our diffuse flux search is kind of like a traditional particle physics search. You collect the data, you, you, know, you analyze it, and then you release the results two or three years later or whatever. Okay. And of course, when we did this at conferences, astronomers would say, we need the data quicker. We need to know right now. You know, these could be transient events. These could be flaring events. It could be a flaring event. These could only last you know, months or something, or weeks or even less. And so we need to know where to point our telescopes rapidly. So once we were confident in our measurements that we, you know, we were confident that we were actually seeing neutrinos, we started sending uh, live alerts. And so we started this in April 2016. We updated our alerts uh, in June of 2019 to include a kind of lower period sample, which we call our bronze sample for people who are interested. And the way this works is once the uh, neutrino interacts in the detector, it's processed automatically. And if it meets our selection criteria, if it's high enough quality, then uh, it goes to the north and then goes into our alert system. And we send what's called a GCN notice. This is the gamma ray coordinates network. This is public, anyone can look at it. And this of course is automated and it actually happens within 33 seconds. So the median latency on these alerts from the neutrino interacting in the detector to us sending a public alert to the world is 33 seconds. And that, that way, uh, anyone who has a telescope available is interested if the source is in their sky and they have time and all this other stuff, they can point their telescope and look and see, do they see an electromagnetic counterpart or something interesting? And so uh, we've been doing this for quite some time. On average, our gold alerts kind of go out about once a month. Um, the bronze alerts are a little bit more often than that, but they kind of on average once a month. And of course, all the cool kids are on Twitter. So we have a, you know, the uh, UWIC Twitter feed. Uh, is where we also uh, post our live alerts, but this is kind of the official location of the GCN. So this is just an example of an alert that we sent uh, in uh, 2020, late 2020. And uh, so you know, this is the event view. This is a track. It's upgoing, so it's almost certainly a neutrino. And uh, so we tell uh, you know we all the we tell the world this is where the neutrino came from on the sky. If you're interested, you can point your telescope there and see if you see something interesting. So I mentioned we've you know, been sending these alerts out about once a month. Most of the time, the corresponding you know uh, electromagnetic telescopes don't really see anything interesting in terms of correlation. Uh, our most interesting uh, coincidence, however, happened in September of 2017. Uh, that was an extremely busy time for multi-messenger astronomy because it was just shortly after uh, LIGO had seen the uh, collision of two neutron stars. And we knew about that early because we had private communications with LIGO and I, we had to keep you know, that a secret. So we were doing a lot of multi-messenger astronomy at the time. We were also following up the LIGO event. But this is a different thing. Uh, we saw a 290 TeV neutrino. And when we sent out the alert, uh, the Fermi telescope noticed that there was a flaring blazar, a known blazar, right? It was already in the catalog, but it was in a flaring state. It was emitting more gamma rays than usual. Uh, and it was located, you know, right, so the, the blazar is in green in the center here, and the uh, kind of uh, uh, green square next to it is the uh, best fit location of our neutrino. Uh, the error contours are the gray and red around that. And uh, then the MAGIC telescope, which is an even higher energy gamma ray observatory in Fermi, it's ground-based, they went and they found the highest energy gamma rays that had ever been seen from this blazar. 
And that's interesting because the higher energy the gamma rays, the more likely they are to be associated with neutrino and these energies. And so we ended up publishing in Science. And additionally, we looked at our own data. Um, you know, we, you know, Ice Cube is looking in all directions by default all the time. So we can always look at our archival data. And we found that uh, between uh, late 2014 and early 2015, there had been a flare uh, in our neutrino sample from the location of this source. So the uh, blazar is the cross here, and then the neutrinos you know, with their PSFs are shown here. This plot in blue is the best fit for the spectral index of those neutrinos. Uh, it's about e to the minus two, which is a pretty hard spectrum. So again, this is interesting. Now, the uh, uh, a chance coincidence between this neutrino and this blazar is if favored at about the three sigma level. And uh, you know th these uh, neutrinos being atmospheric in origin is also disfavored about 3.5 sigma. Not quite a smoking gun. We like five sigma in particle physics. Uh, but certainly very interesting. And so you know, that is still the most interesting multi-messenger event that we've seen. Uh, but in both cases, this is a blazar. The galaxy that I showed you that uh, we had the strongest association with in the 10-year neutrino search was an active galaxy. So we're seeing hints of active galaxies being associated with neutrinos. Okay, so now I'm going to um, you know, switch gears a bit and uh, show you uh, some plots from uh, one of our more uh, recent papers, um, which uh, received some attention. And this is quite interesting because it's a different type of uh, neutrino interaction than what I've been talking to you about so far. And it's both new and it's also very old, as I will show you. Um, so the uh, deep and elastic scattering is an interaction between the neutrino and the nucleon. And what's shown here is the cross section of the uh, interaction as a function of energy. And the uh, blue and uh, you know, yellow red curves are deep and elastic scattering. Charged current has a slightly higher uh, cross section than neutral current. And there's a little bit of a difference between neutrinos and anti neutrinos, especially at low energies. But all of these are interactions with the nucleon, that's the capital N. For most energies, the uh, probability of this interaction dominates over the probability of interaction with the electron. But you know, these, these ice molecules and atoms all have electrons as well. However, there is one energy at which there's actually a very high probability of interaction between an electron and an anti-neutrino. This only works for an anti-neutrino. So what exactly is this all about? So this is why it's old. Uh, this actually came from Sheldon Glashow, and I believe this was when he was on sabbatical. I only could wish you know, that my sabbatical would be something so interesting. Um, but he was on sabbatical uh, in uh, you know, 1959 or 1960. And he wrote a paper uh, where he was thinking about uh, the boson that mediates the decay of the muon, which we now know is the W boson. At the time, he actually called it the Z, and it hadn't been discovered yet. It's only been theorized. Actually, let me bring up the, uh, so this is the muon decay, right? This is a muon decaying, and uh, out comes a muon neutrino that's mediated by the W boson. And on the other side, what you actually see is an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. Now, if, if this goes the other way, and the uh, anti-electron uh, neutrino interacts with the electron, then at a certain energy, you can have a resonance where you will produce a real W boson that you will then see via its real decay products in the ice. Um, so now at the time, uh, again, this was 1960. The W boson wasn't actually observed until 1983. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 the uh, energy of the interaction, that's just conservation of energy and momentum. It's a relatively simple calculation. And this is what you get. The energy, this should, actually should be energy of the anti-neutrino, because this will only work with an electron for an anti-neutrino. If you want to work for a neutrino, you need a positron. We don't have positrons in the ice. Um, so it's the square of the W mass divided by twice the mass of the electron. And uh, at the time, Glashow wasn't sure what the mass of the W was because it hadn't been observed. I think he called it a Z in the paper, which of course is a different boson on that. Um, so he thought it was maybe between the mass of a kaon and a nucleon, that is less than a, you know, about a GeV. Uh, but actually, the W boson mass is 80 GeV. So if he had been you know, right in his estimate of the W mass, then we'd actually be able to see the Glashow resonance all the time in air showers. It'd be a very nice energy calibration uh, tool. So that's a kind of a shame. But in actuality, uh, if you plug the mass of the W boson into this equation, uh, the anti-neutrino energy that you need is 6.3 PeV. So 6.3 times 10 to the 15 electron volt. And that is something that only ice cube or an equivalent experiment can see. Um, so this is not new physics. This is not exotic. This is like, you know, totally, you know, basic 
energy conservation physics. The only reason that it is difficult is because the energy that's needed is so high. Um, so in this case, we have the electron neutrino coming in and interacting with the electron, and out comes the W boson. And the W boson has a 68% branching ratio to hadrons, um, so that will you know just make a bunch of uh, mesons, some of which will produce muons. That's important. Uh, whereas with the deep and elastic scattering, you have the uh, you know neutrino interacting with the nucleon, and then out comes you know you know the various products I discussed before. So the important thing here, again, to emphasize is that the glass shell resonance only works if your target is electron, which it is in ice. It only works with anti-neutrinos. This is an interaction which will tell you not only you know that you've got a neutrino, but you've got an anti-neutrino. I'll tell you why that's important in a bit. So we did not see anything like that energy in our contained search. As I mentioned, the highest energy we saw in our contained search was 2 keV. So we expanded and started looking at partially contained cascades, cascades that were interacting like on the edge of the detector. And this is the highest energy one we've seen. Uh, we nicknamed it hydrangea after the hydrangea flower. Um, and so, um, you know, the glass resonance is about 6 keV. If that had interacted in the center of the detector, this is what it would look like. So it would light up the entire detector, you know, like a Christmas tree. This is kind of the, the bottom half of the detector. Uh, but what we saw was, you know, this kind of partially contained cascade. So we had to, you know, do a lot of work on the energy reconstruction. Um, but our best fit energy reconstruction was about 6 keV. There's obviously, you know, quite some uh, uncertainty there. I think about 0.7 uh, PV at the 68% uh, uncertainty. And if we look at the various possibilities for producing this, the most likely are either a glass shell resonance where the uh, W is decaying the hadron or the charge current uh, interaction. And the uh, glass shell resonance is favored at about 2.3 uh, sigma, or I should say <coughs> the, uh, the other scenarios are disfavored at the 2.3 sigma level. So it's still not quite you know, at the three or five sigma level, but certainly uh, very interesting. Now, one thing which made it even more interesting, and we were actually discovering this at the same time that we were dealing with the Texas or the, the Blazar event called Texas, and also the you know uh, general, uh, also the uh, LIGO event. So this is a very busy time for us. Um, but we found out that there uh, appeared to be leading muons, that is, muons that were outranging the light from the cascade a little bit. And so what's shown here are some waveforms from a couple of the events at the bottom here. And you see some early light in those waveforms. This is on, again on uh, individual DOMs, uh, light that is arriving early with respect to the expectation of just the cascade. And so these are the individual hits uh, 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 as a function of depth. So it's the time on the DOM as a function of uh, sorry, depth of the DOM as a uh, function of the time of the first hit. And you see this kind of bump on one of the strings, and that bump is best explained by a cascade with muons outranging it. So what am I talking about by muons outranging it? This is a lot easier to see. Um, so this is the simulated cascade. Um, and you see all the light coming from the cascade. Now the light from the cascade will travel at the speed of light in ice, index of refraction in ice at this uh, uh, wavelength is about 1.36. Uh, the muons, however, they will be traveling at the speed of light in vacuum. So they will outrace the light and they will kind of come out ahead. And just fortuitously, we happen to have ours pointed in the direction of the detector. So we saw this early light from the muon. Now, why it's interesting to see muons, again, the glass shell resonance has a 68% branching ratio to hadrons, and therefore we expect muons to be produced uh, from uh, decay of mesons uh, in the hadron cascade. Now, you could in principle see this from a deep and elastic scattering as well, um, but the glass shell hypothesis is favored due to the energy. Uh, again, uh, the uh, other scenarios are disfavored at a 2.3 sigma level. Now, we can't say anything definitive based on a single event, um, but we did publish this uh, in this one was out of nature or science. Um, in nature. Um, so why is this interesting? So again, the physics itself is is not new or exotic. We're not we're not discovering new physics here. We're discovering something that the only reason we haven't seen it is because it's such a high energy. However, first of all, this you know neutrino, because it is very high energy, um, it is almost certainly astrophysical in origin. Uh, because you don't really get uh, neutrinos of that energy from the atmosphere. It's not entirely impossible, but you know, certainly uh, astrophysical origins favor. And 
Finally, this is or, or sorry, next. Uh, this is the only process in ice cube that could distinguish between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos on an event-by-event -event basis. We have been trying to do some separation in our atmospheric neutrinos, but that would be statistical, uh, not on an event-by-event -event basis. So, if this is a glass show event, uh, then it must be an anti-neutrino. Okay. Now, why is it important whether it's a neutrino or an anti-neutrino? Uh, that's because it can give us information about the astrophysical environment. So let me bring up this again. Um, so kind of zooming in on the photopion decay that we were looking at before. Um, what kind of pylons you see will depend on the environment. So if you have uh, protons interacting with gamma rays, it's going to produce positive pylons. And if you look at this is the positive pion decay is the shell on the left, negative pylons on the right. If you look at the positive pions, you do not get any electron antineutrinos. You do get muon antineutrinos, but you don't get electron antineutrinos because the thing is positive. And so um, you get electron neutrinos, just not antineutrinos. So at the source, you would have a one to zero electron neutrino to antineutrino ratio. Now you still could see electron antineutrinos at Earth because these muon antineutrinos could change flavor into electron antineutrinos on the way to Earth. Um, but you know, there would be you know, somewhat suppressed compared to the second scenario, which I'll discuss. And you could have even further suppression if you have strong magnetic fields, which could cause the muons to lose energy uh, before they decay and therefore produce lower energy neutrinos. Now, if you have an environment where the protons are interacting mostly with other protons, then you're going to have both positive and neg negative pions produced. And again, this is the simplistic scenario, but you would get a one to one electron neutrino to anti neutrino ratio of the source, and you get much more anti neutrinos at Earth. So this is where we stand currently with the diffuse flux of neutrinos, of which this flash hour resonance event is a part. We can't really do very much with the direction of that at the moment. Um, but uh, there's kind of a lot on this plot. The green points are our uh, cascade search. Uh, the uh, blue line with the shade is through going neons. This red event here is the uh, flash hour resonance. And then we've got some upper limits here on various searches for extremely high energy neutrinos in, from us, as well as some other experiments, Jorge and Anita, uh, looking for uh, extremely high energy neutrinos. Um, so, you know, kind of leads us to the question of what is uh, next uh, in terms of uh, exploring this landscape, both trying to improve, because right now, again, we've got one flash resonance, you know, event, one flash resonance candidate, we've got, you know, two tau neutrino candidates. Uh, we've got kind of three sigma level associations with active galaxies, so we want to you know, move beyond that. So you know, the answer is always build a bigger detector, right? We need a bigger, uh, bigger telescope, bigger, bigger, bigger everything. Um, so we are uh, in the process of planning uh, the next generation of ice cube, which we call ice cube Gen two, which is both a reference to the next generation, you know, next generation, and also uh, Gen two penguin is a type of penguin, uh, and we like to remind everyone that we're without holes and fun. And uh, so this is a view of the current ice cube detector right here. And this uh, kind of yellow uh, area here is what we envision as the next generation of the optical detector. Um, so that'll be of a similar technology to ice cube. And then even further beyond that and more ambitious is a radio detector. And that is what Dave Besson and his group are uh, working on. Uh, that would be following in the footsteps of uh, many radio detectors, including the current uh, RNOG detector, which uh, just got uh, started with deployment. And there's also a plan for the first step of this Gen 2 is to upgrade the ice cube detector by deploying some new strength in the very center. So that's what's over here on the very uh, right hand side. So uh, in terms of the uh, improvement in the diffuse flux, um, this is where we are now. And then these blue points indicate where we would be in, I think this is a uh, uh, 10 year, uh, 10 years of new uh, Gen 2 data. So we'd be able to see how far out does the flux go? Is there a cutoff? Does it change spectral shape? Uh, does it change its spectral index? You know, that is what we'd be able to know uh, by being able to be sensitive to high energy neutrinos. We would also be able to be sensitive to five times fainter sources because we would have an order of magnitude increase in detection volume. Uh, that would you know, not only give us more things like more town neutrinos and more flash resonance events, but also more and longer tracks. And so uh, this is our current point source sensitivity uh, at a deformation of zero degrees, and this is where we'd be with Gen 2. So again, I'm just went there in 10 years uh, in blue here. So we get uh, you know, kind of a you know, close to an order of magnitude increase in sensitivity. And the point source sensitivities of uh, CTA, which is the next generation uh, gamma ray telescope, is shown in green here. 
<laughs> so this is just showing the diffuse flux and you know kind of a larger uh, form so again you know these are the points we have here and then this is where we hope to be so we'd be able to see again do we see a cutoff do we see uh change in spectral shape you know where we see you know, we'll be able to get uh, far more statistics with a detector of this size so the first, so the uh, Gen 2 detector is in planning. We do not have a, uh, you know, uh, we do not have that funded yet, but we do have our first phase funded, which we call the IP upgrade. And so uh, Dave uh, Nesson is working on some uh, instruments for that. And I'm the calibration coordinator for the upgrade because I hate sleep. Um, and uh, so this is, this is the, oh, this is the current IP detector in blue here. And the uh, new strings are deployed in red in the center. And this is not going to help us with uh, astrophysical neutrinos per se. It's not increasing the volume of the detector at all, but it will give us some uh, new data in our uh, atmospheric neutrino uh, fundamental oscillation search, specifically tau neutrino appearance in the atmospheric sector, different from cosmic tau's, uh, but extremely interesting science. Um, we're also deploying a lot of new calibration instrumentation, uh, in both in the optical and also in the radio. Uh, as well as uh, 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 in the acoustic, uh, and we're going to be able to calibrate uh, the ice cube optical uh, properties and DOM response even better and apply that calibration to our existing data set, which is the last one here. And finally, we're uh, testing out new sensor designs, which will go into Gen 2. So this is serving as a test bed for Gen 2 technology. And uh, we've got two different main sensors in the upgrade. Uh, the theme is having more PMTs facing in more directions, not just a single PMT facing downward, which we have an ice cube. And this here, which we call the MNOM, uh, this is, I'm sorry, I always forget how many of these uh, small PMTs, um, but you know, <clears throat> somewhere, somewhere around 20 or so of these small PMTs facing in all directions. Uh, this is intended to be kind of the uh, concept for the uh, design for uh, Gen 2. And we also have another concept, which is just one PMT up and one PMT down. This will give us better sensitivity in all directions and more precision reconstruction because we'll have the segmented sensor, you know, that has, you know, we can really break down what light we're changing in what direction. Okay. So uh, in summary, um, so we've seen the first hints of association between our high energy neutrino flux and active galaxies. And we've detected our first flash or resonance event, um, which gives us more insight into cosmic accelerator environments, whether uh, protons are interacting with gamma rays or other protons. Uh, we have an approved upgrade proposal, and I forgot to mention we're scheduled to deploy in 2022-2023, but we're still evaluating the impact of COVID on our schedules. That is subject to change. Um, and uh, so, but that will allow us to uh, recalibrate the detector as well as giving us a new sensitivity in our low energy physics searches. And we're planning our uh, uh, future uh, Gen 2 detector. We're you know, breathlessly awaiting the uh, results of the Astro 2020 survey, just like everyone else. And uh, so these are uh, very exciting times. Uh, we can have a, an event anytime, you know, an alert that comes in that has something exciting happen. And we've also got a lot of other work going on in all of our topics, including the ones I wasn't able to cover in today's talk. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you so much. So perhaps we can start with questions from outside. If there's anyone who wants to ask a question. Going once. So, um, yeah, we can so hear you. you. You you give alerts to other telescopes. Um, is is your data public so that other people can can go back? Um, we have, yeah, we have. To, to some the public, Chris. Yeah, we have some public data sets. Uh, not all of our data is public, um, but we have released a number of public data sets. Um, a couple of them recently. So, if you go to our webpage, icecube.west.edu. Uh, that will uh, lead you to our uh, public data. Okay, there's a question about any predictions as to what it is about <coughs> M77 that makes it stand out in the neutrino map. Um, so I can't say that at this point. That's still a work in progress. But yeah, stay tuned. Uh, John Ralston, I see your hand is up. Oops, hi. Hi, Don. 
Hi, John. Uh, nice to see you again. Sounds sounds like you can hear me and see and hear me. Yeah. Now I, I have a I have a trick question. There's a trap in it. Uh oh. It's, it's always like that, right? Who had the idea to detect hot ultra high energy neutrinos in South Pole ice? Um, there, I, I, I would never venture to say from my own memory. If I wanted to look it up, I would look up the article, which I think uh, Christian Spearing wrote for the CERN uh, thing a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, I do not remember off the top of my head. Okay, well, see, you knew it was a trap. It was Ed Zeller, a former visitor to our department. <clears throat> and uh, he uh, told me that uh, the South Pole ice was the clearest substance on earth while he was listening to a colloquium by Francis Falson. Uh, many, many years ago. Uh, then uh, I said, Ed, let's go tell Francis. So after the colloquium, Ed went up there and he said, you should be detecting neutrinos in ice, not this business of this dirty salt water, which was, of course, Dubon. And uh, a couple months later, uh, Bob Morse from Madison uh, went to the ice uh, archives at the University of Colorado, talked to the ice people, and uh, started planning on going to the South Pole. So it, it started in this colloquium, oh, and we have the day. Yeah, we're, we're, we're full circle. So Francis Halson is the PI of our experiment. He's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, for those of you who don't know him. Um, and yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of work going on. There is still work going on in water, um, specifically <coughs> in the Mediterranean. The advantage of, of that is that you do want to have detectors in both hemispheres, and there isn't really great ice in the northern hemisphere. The Greenland ice is kind of filthy optically. It's okay for radio, but not really great for optical. And the South Pole ice is the clearest <coughs> ice on Earth. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. My throat, I, I don't have coats. My throat's a little dry. Um, and uh, so, yes, the uh, South Pole ice is of exceptionally high uh, optical clarity. It still has very complex properties that we have to take into account. And we've learned that, like, I could give a whole talk on just the ice. I have, I have done with that. Are there any questions inside the room for the speaker? Oh. Great, I think my phone is Hello. Um, my question was, can you hint neutrinos coming like from the North Pole? I mean, not from the North Pole. Can you hint neutrinos that travel through the Earth? Yes. Do okay. they look different? Like, can you tell? I mean, we can tell. We can tell the direction. Um, now, uh, at lower energies, neutrinos that travel directly through the Earth uh, will undergo flavor change. These are the ones in the atmosphere. And that is the kind of the basis of our oscillation physics studies, which is a whole topic I wasn't able to cover, but we've actually done some very interesting work there. Um, but uh, for uh, for an astrophysical neutrino, you know, the, the neutrino is a neutrino. They don't look that different coming from the North Pole versus you know, from the Northern Hemisphere sky versus the Southern Hemisphere sky. The only thing that's different is that the Southern Hemisphere sky, you're being flooded with muons at a very high rate, so you have to make harsher cuts. Other questions? Um, so there was a question from the chat. Why did they change flavors when passing through the Earth? Um, so neutrinos change flavor in flight depending on their energy, the distance they're traveling, and the density of the environment they're traveling in. So to make a very long story short, uh, for atmospheric neutrinos coming through the Earth, um, 25 GeV is where you have maximum probability of a muon neutrino turning into a tau neutrino. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the, so the oscillation physics would be you know, a whole other topic, but you can calculate the probability. And uh, so, but that is kind of where a, a oscillation maximum is, and that's also where we uh, we get, have good sensitivity in deep core at 25 GeV. So that's where we do our uh, studies there. Other experiments do uh, flavor changing studies in other environments at other distances, depending on how they're set up. And so it will just depend on their, their energy and the distance between their detector and their, and their neutrino source. Neutrinos also change flavor in the sun. So I really enjoyed the talk, thanks. Oh, thank you. In the first time you talked, 
could you explain again why it is that glazes particularly rather than all AGN are good sources for your target? So a, all AGN could be potential sources because there is um, acceleration going, uh, potentially going on the disk as well in the accretion flow. Um, but blazars are interesting because that is where the highest energy gamma rays are seen. And so because of the association between gamma rays and neutrinos with gamma rays, if they're coming from neutral pions and uh, uh, neutrinos coming from charged pions, that is an interesting association. But there are other things as well. And so uh, the, you know, for the purpose of the colloquium, and because the most you know, interesting event that we've seen uh, that was built in Messenger came from a blazar, that's probably focus. But there is a lot of other stuff going on. Pretty much each of which could take up a whole cloak. But yes, there are other things going on, and you can have neutrino uh, 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 production in sources which are uh, opaque to gamma rays, because if the gamma rays happen to be absorbed or suppressed in an opaque source, just like you know, it's, it's pretty easy to absorb and suppress photons depending on the environment. Neutrinos could still get out because they interact, you know, strongly with matter. And so yes, there are uh, you know classes of sources that we're looking into which are gamma dark. Or is M77 work? Oh Lord, I looked this up for the colloquium, but uh, check check my map. I think it's 47 million light years. So it's not that distant because again, this is a Messier galaxy. For those of you who are not astronomers, the Messier gap catalog was put together, I think, in the 1700s by a French astronomer. And so this is relatively close by bright galaxies that could be seen with the telescopes of the time. And of course, at the time they didn't know they were galaxies, they thought they were star clusters or nebulae or something like that. It wasn't until the 20th century that they knew. That they were galaxies and how distant they were. Yeah, and then 77 is a relatively close neighbor. But double check my number because I'm doing that from memory. <laughs> Thank you again for, for the talk. A uh, question a bit less physics, but more about uh, the situation in the South Pole. Has any of the changes, uh, pollution, but with the temperature changes, affect ice cube experiments in terms of ice? melting fracture the, the ice yeah i haven't I, I get that question all the time we haven't seen any effects like that at the pole uh, there's some unusual aspects to being specifically at the pole um and we're deep in the you know well relatively deep in the interior of antarctica so dave besson might know more about what's going on there uh, than, than we do but we we haven't seen like the same kind of uh, issues for example that they've seen uh, in greenland or, or, or sometimes i think they had rain uh this year we haven't seen anything like that before. Additional questions for the speaker? Yeah, thank, thanks again, Don, for, for, for that talk. Just hopefully a quick question. So when you get an alert from another experiment, is it possible for Ice Cube, maybe in firmware at the FPGA level, to train the uh, to train the trigger in a particular direction, or are the signals rates just too high to prohibit that? Yeah, we haven't done anything like that. So we do follow up on other experiments as well as other experiments following up on us because we collect data all the time. So we don't need to do data like right this second, right? You know, if, if we if the data if the data came in, you know, a year ago or five minutes ago, we've got that data. Um, our trigger is generalized enough that we don't think we we would miss anything major. Um, now we do have kind of a, a follow up on your question a little bit. We do have a, a system which is called Hit School. Uh, this system captures everything above the discriminator level of the photomultiplier tube, which is set at 0.25 photoelectrons. That hit school captures everything uh, at the DOM level. And if need be, we take that and we send the whole kit and caboodle up to the northern hemisphere. That is what we would do, for example, if we had a galactic supernova. But for our run of the mill follow ups that we do, um, and I think we also did, we did that for the gravitational wave event. Uh, but for a run of the mill follow ups that we do, like if someone sees a bright new flaring blazar, or if someone sees a, 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 you know, a supernova in another galaxy, or if we haven't seen one in our own galaxy anytime recently, or if someone sees a supernova in another galaxy that's relatively close by or might be interesting, then we follow up on that. Optically violent variables, uh, magnetars, things like that, any kind of you know, violent transient event will follow up on that. But for those, we just use our standard uh, event selection. However, we do have the option of grabbing absolutely everything, you know, regardless of singles rate. I think we buffer for about a week. Uh, I'd have to check our instrumentation and online systems. Uh, but yeah, if we have an extraordinary event and we need to see absolutely everything, we do have that uh, capability. Obviously, most of what gets to the north is highly filtered uh, in order to fit within the bandwidth of our satellite. 
We transmit, I think, about 100 gigabytes a day. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so Daniel uh, Tapia Takaki wishes me a uh, productive time in the department. Thank you very much. So far, it's been very interesting. <laughs> Are there additional questions inside or outside the room? Uh, thank you for the talk. That's very interesting and very interesting. <clears throat> um, uh, Dr. Bress mentioned that um, you can sort of do this collaboration between the three commissions. Uh, is there any, what do you, I guess, um, Collaborate with other neutrino uh, detectors, um, such as with um, LSNT. So, um, like, I remember it was a event a few years ago, and then, like, people were just, you know, fall and rave. Is it possible, like, for two, I guess, detectors to sort of work in tandem where one person sees something, they ask the other person, hey, was it, did you see anything weird? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so there is a few things that we do. Um, now, we obviously, if it's an astrophysical event that is something that came from a specific place at a specific time, then uh, we uh, will collaborate usually with other astronomical telescopes. However, there are modes of interaction that we do with detectors. I don't know if we've done LSD in particular, but um, with uh, Minifone and other uh, neutrino detectors, one of the things we do is, and I don't think, I don't know if we necessarily do that ourselves, but we contribute to what are called global fits. So in uh, neutrino physics and particle physics generally, but especially in neutrino physics, the properties of neutrinos, we usually have like multiple experiments pool their data, and that gives us a better uh, handle on whatever quantity we're trying to measure. Um, so we do that. Um, we have also, uh, we, we can obviously, you know, uh, when data is public from another experiment, we do a sterile neutrino search. So we have you know, compared our data to data from uh, mini moon or micro moon or you know whoever. Um, and also, there's another thing we do. I, I'm not super familiar with this search, uh, but we can again kind of uh, pool data with certain types of detectors, uh, such as uh, such as Juno or say future detectors, and get better global constraints actually on dark matter searches. Um, so this is more of a future thing, uh, but yes, we can, uh, you know, get uh, information by pooling data. Now, in that case, we're not seeing the same events. In that case, we're seeing atmospheric events, and they're seeing events from, you know, they're like, yes, Juno's yesterday, I think. I can't remember. Um, but you know, we, we can pool our data together, and so we've actually published. I think it was published uh, not too long ago. A joint study for the future of the ice cube upgrade, and was that a Juno or Hyper K? I'm sorry, my brain is not working too well. Uh, but we uh, said, okay, this is how much better sensitivity we could get to a dark matter search if we pooled our data with that. So yeah, we do have a lot of different collaborations. Each collaboration works kind of differently. Our public alerts, those go out to the whole world. Anyone can look at those. We do have special additional collaborations with other telescopes where we will send them private alerts. Uh, we used to get private alerts from LIGO. So back before, like, you know, they were public, they would send us their information. Uh, now, I mean, they're collaborating with a lot of astronomers, and astronomers are famous for being kind of, you know, <laughs> chatty. And uh, so uh, there, there's always really rumors going around on Twitter and all this kind of stuff before they officially announced uh, their big results. Um, but those were all um, under kind of a, you know, a memorandum of understanding with, you know, some degree of confidentiality. Uh, but in order to really do astronomy these days, Putting your data out in public as soon as possible is really the most desirable thing because of these events possibly being quite transient. Have you ever encountered any strange events that are, you know, like, you know, like something that we didn't expect or like hard to explain from the ice cube? Um, can't really think of like an event per se. Um, you know, we we uh, we we do searches for new physics, and all you know, we haven't really seen anything that's consistent with new physics so far. Um, everything we've ever seen with a detector that looked weird, uh, we were able to track down to uh, usually an artificial. Uh, you know, not, I should not not say artificial, but some kind of glitch in the detector. Uh, we had a dom which we ran the high voltage too high on, and it started sparking and making these weird oscillation, uh, you know, sinusoidal waveforms in the detector. Uh, we had a, 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 a laser-based calibration device 
that basically lost contact with the surface and started firing off all its missiles like some kind of doomsday device and we had to clean that up. That was, uh, yeah, that was fun. Uh, and a few things like that, but we could always trace it down to uh, cause. Oh, there was one other time, some big old radar that was on the surface. They were looking for meteors, so meteor radar, bouncing off meteor trail or something. And they had a backlog, which just went straight into the detector and lit up the whole thing like a Christmas tree. So we had to deal with that. So uh, that's less often now. Um, that was more, you know, in the early construction days of the detector. But uh, yeah, mostly, you know, anything we've ever seen that was weird, we were able to trace down to a, uh, to, usually to some physical artifact in the detector that could be explained in many ways. Any additional questions for the speaker? So what, what made you reject the idea of uh, mu mu bar, possibly to mu mu bar again for the glass of resonance? I'm sorry, say again? What made you reject the idea of mu mu bar, oscillates to mu mu bar for the glass of resonance? Um, I don't think we've rejected that. We, we can't tell what the new E bar was originally. We can only say that the new E bar, if the glass of resonance said it's a new E bar, when it, it is in the detector. But at the source, it could have been a new E bar that oscillated. So it's possible that the proton interacted with another proton as well as them in the in the source. Yes, it would be proton proton. We don't we don't expect too many anti protons in, in okay. the source. Well, it's possible, but not that. Okay. Are there any additional questions from either inside the room or on Zoom? If not, let's thank the speaker again for a wonderful talk. So at this point, we would kindly invite all of the faculty to